All right, so first I have a question for this group. Uh, I'd really like to understand who, who we're talking to today. So how many folks here are, would consider themselves to be computer scientists? Don't really know much about numerical math, algorithms, libraries, that kind of thing? OK, excellent. No, <laughs> a liar. <laughs> and then how many folks are uh, more on the computational math side, computational science side? OK, so the group that just rose, ra raised your hands, there's going to be about half a dozen slides or so in my presentation that you can just go read your email, because I'm going to be introducing the 1D heat, heat equation uh, for those who are the computer scientists. So they get a, just a general sense of what it is we're talking about today. So, so this is track four in the Argonne training program. And what we're particularly focused on in this session is looking at numerical algorithms and software for extreme scale science. So the way we've organized this session is through a series of lectures and hands-on exercises that are related that will be going on throughout the day. And what we've tried to do is select a, a subset of algorithms and software that will give you a general feel for the overall problem solution, ranging from the discretization of the problem to the solution of linear and nonlinear problems through uh, more predictive science capabilities such as optimization. So you can see the, do we have a, yep, the speakers that we have lined up today. Um, Mark Miller, who is right here, you will see a lot of, uh, because he's in charge of our hands-on, and so he'll be uh, helping out with that uh, all day today. Uh, we'll start with the discretization technologies. In this particular session, we're going to focus on unstructured grids. Uh, in, in other years, future years, we'll focus more on structured grids. We'll move on to time integration and nonlinear solvers after lunch, the Krylov and multigrid solvers as, as part of that session, and then looking at sparse direct solvers and numerical optimization. And then we'll conclude the day with with one perspective on, on putting it all together into a single application and what does that look like. And hopefully by the end of the day, you'll have a good sense of why numerical software libraries are so important to the scientific computing uh, enterprise. So I want to also acknowledge all of the contributors to the lectures and the hands-on, some of whom are here in the room, some of whom could not be with us today, and those who have also contributed slides to our, our gallery of highlights. So our goals for this tutorial today are threefold. First, uh, we want to provide you a basic understanding of a variety of applied math uh, algorithms and approaches and software for the whole suite of, of what it takes to create a forward simulation for high performance computing, what the challenges are, what some of the techniques for solving those challenges are, provide an overview of the software tools that exist today that are available to you uh, so that if you are working on a computational science ch grand challenge of your own, you can download these and, and use them, including you know, where to go for more information or where to go to, for the software. And then the hands-on will provide practice for you in using one or more of these pieces of software tools on basic demonstration problems so you can get a sense of what, what's needed and what's required to use that software. In terms of what I'm going to try and accomplish in the next 35 minutes or so before we turn over to our first hands-on, is I want to give you a high-level introduction to the overall steps of what it takes to solve a, a forward simulation, and then introduce high-performance numerical software to you. So we're really looking, as David talked about in his talk, toward extreme scale ecosystems, and what does that mean? As he mentioned, there's an increasing emphasis on data movements to manage power more than managing flops, and so we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, where you can go for more information, and why it's important for you in terms of understanding what libraries are, are good for from your perspective. So they encapsulate a lot of complexity and expertise. There are hundreds of person years in the development of the numerical software libraries that we'll talk about today, and that's something that you can leverage immediately. And so you do not have to be an expert in all of these different areas in order to take advantage of the latest algorithms that are available to you. So in terms of uh, where the software that's coming from that we'll be talking about today, it's from three primary sources. The first is the FastMath SIDAC Institute. SIDAC is a program that's been around in the Department of Energy since about 2000. 
And there's been an effort within that program for the last 18 years that focuses on computational mathematics libraries and bringing the power of those libraries to scientific applications in the Department of Energy. In addition, there's the IDEAS Software Productivity Project uh, that's, I think, just ended, correct? Or is it still going on, Ulrika? Oh, there's still a, an IDEAS project. Still an IDEAS project going on. So this is primarily focused on software productivity and what you need to do in order to make different kinds of libraries interoperable with each other, what makes sense, how do you make them the most usable to the application and scientist. And then most recently, the Exascale Computing Software which, Project, which is picking up a lot of the computational math libraries and taking them to that next generation of architectures that David talked about. So computational science and engineering. So this is a pillar of science today. And it's comprised of three primary components, ranging from the mathematics and statistics that you need to develop the, math, the models, the computer science that's necessary in order to deploy those algorithms and models effectively on high performance computing systems. And then the application knowledge, the science and engineering knowledge that you need to understand the results of those simulations and what those models are meaning and how you interpret them. So this is being increasingly used in all branches of science, not just physical sciences now, but increasingly in uh, the humanities and other areas as well. And one of the things that's happening, and again, this is just echoing a theme that David said, so David and I are going to echo each other a lot, <laughs> is um, the computational science and engineering is really expanding in a lot of new directions. And I wanted to highlight this article that's about to be released in the SIAM review uh, this month. And it's really talking about how this is branching out into, you know, it's continually evolving the mathematical models and algorithms as compute resources become more and more capable. The, the kinds of physics that we can solve become more and more complex. And so we're able to tackle problems now that we could only dream of, you know, 15 years ago. And that's, that going forward is, is causing a new revolution in the kinds of multi-physics types of algorithms that we can think about. The other uh, thing that's kind of interesting, and again, David alluded to this, is the convergence of high performance computing with simulation, uh, with data sciences. And so there are many different areas that, that this is coming through. And I like the matrix that you developed for that. I thought that was a very nice way of showing it. But we're, we're seeing a lot of this in the Department of Energy, where we're bringing data science techniques, machine learning techniques, into simulation directly so that you can, for example, predict when things are about to go wrong in a simulation and maybe try to mitigate that ahead of time. Uh, it can be used for steering. It, it can be used for experimental design. There are lots of ways in which these two very powerful techniques are now coming together to improve science overall. And then, of course, what we're going to be talking about here is software. And, then, and CSC education and workforce development is a critical area, something I know David is very passionate about and others in this room are very passionate about. So software is the key. This is a loop we're going to be talking about a little bit uh, more today, where you start with a problem descri description. What's the physics that you're trying to model? What's the idealization of that? How do you create a mathematical model that describes that problem? turn that into an algorithmic model through discretization techniques, implement that algorithm on perhaps a high performance computing machine with heterogeneous node architectures, do the simulation analysis, and continue around that circle of development for increasingly stronger uh, interpretive simulation. Then you also can develop new insight through data analysis for model validation, model verification, et cetera. And increasingly, we can start to add things to this loop that take us more from just interpretation to prediction. And of course, software is an integral part of that. And that's what we'll be spending a lot of our time talking about today. In addition, a, a big motivator, as I was just alluding to, for exascale computing is the fact that the more capable computers allow us to do more physics. And multi-physics is a primary driver for exascale computing as we know it. There are many, many problems that require different physical components to interact together. And those interactions can be very, very complex. And so you can think about all different kinds of systems, like nuclear reactors or particle accelerators or fusion tokamaks, where the physics and the mechanical systems are very complex. They interact in very interesting and perhaps nonlinear ways. And so there's a famous quote by Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington that basically says, we often think 
that when we have completed our study of one, we know all about two, because two is one and one. We forget that we still have to make a study of and. And that's, I think, a really interesting quote, because you may think you understand the fluid dynamics associated with a given problem, or the chemistry, or the structural mechanics. But when you put those things together, they can interact in ways that are not necessarily uh, predictable just by the individual physics themselves. So there are lots of interesting, n and again, potentially nonlinear interactions that you have to make a study of. And so you need that complete system, the multi-physics system, in order to study the problem as a whole. So this is just another view of that loop that I showed earlier. And we're going to start talking now a little bit about the particular steps that you need in modeling a partial differential equation, for example. So you first want to develop a physics model. So everything that, that we see around us can be described mathematically to various degrees of fidelity. So climate systems, we're having storms today outside. It's raining hard. These are all governed by uh, partial differential equations, stochastic models, et cetera. And so you can develop those models and think about them in an ideali idealized way. Often those, those equations, though, are too difficult to solve analytically. And so you need approximation techniques or discretization techniques in order to, to make uh, progress on understanding and interpreting what those models can tell you. And so that's where you start getting into things like approximating a geometric domain by breaking it up into different kinds of elements, unstructured grids, structured grids, uh, taking the, the mathematical equations that you have and discretizing those using various different techniques for uh, representing the, the algorithms using either piecewise linear or pointwise uh, equations, and then solving that discrete system and potentially refining it until you get an answer that's within a certain error tolerance. And this requires a lot of different steps in the process, ranging from going from a computational domain to breaking it up into small pieces, a, a step that's known as mesh generation, to looking at the algorithm uh, discretization, so finite element techniques, finite different techniques, et cetera, solving the linear systems uh, using Krylov solvers or iterative solvers, doing perhaps mesh refinement to focus where the solutions are most interesting. That requires adapting the mesh on the fly, perhaps in parallel, which would then require new partitioning techniques, load balancing techniques. Perhaps you have an eigen system that you need to solve. So you can see it can be a very complex interplay of different numerical algorithms. Uh, not uh, any one of us want to be an expert in all of those different algorithms. And so that's where the libraries come into play. And then you can take that that single simulation loop that's really focused on a forward model and doing that in the most effective way possible, and then embed that in, an, in a bigger analysis loop, where you can start to turn more towards interpreting what's going on in the world around you to predicting what's going on in the world around you. So for example, doing uncertainty quantification, understanding the error in the model and the simulation process that you have, doing optimization and design. So running a number of simulations and trying to figure out what's the best airfoil design for that airplane, for, for example. And this requires a whole nother set of numerical algorithms and capabilities beyond what I just talked about, ranging from adjoints and sensitivities to ensemble simulations. You know, how are you going to run all of these things and coordinate them? How are you going to sample? How are you going to decide which parameters to run and why? So lots and lots of interesting questions that arise where, again, numerical libraries and software can help with that, with those tasks. So this is where those who are mathematicians can pay no, uh, zero attention to me for the next five minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to take you through a 1D heat equation. So for the computer scientists in the room who really don't have any idea what I'm talking about, here's your chance. So I want you to think about a 1D rod. And it's you know, represented here with this black line. It's got one end in a hot water bath. It's got another end in the cold water bath. And if you just think about what happens to that rod uh, over time, you can imagine well, this end is going to be quite hot. This end is going to be quite cold. In fact, they'll be the temperatures of the hot and cold water baths, respectively. And in between, it'll just be a you know, linear ramp between the two, potentially, right? if it's a homogeneous material. Turns out you can model that using a diffusion equation, which mathematically is represented with this delta squared type symbol, where t is going to be the temperature of our rod. 
And we have boundary conditions. So at the hot water bath, we'll call that T0. It's going to be maybe 180 degrees. At T1, the cold water bath end, maybe it'll be zero degrees. So that's our mathematical model for this particular physics problem. So then we need to discretize that. So if we just think about this in one dimension, we can think about taking that, that rod and saying, well, I'd really like to understand what that temperature is at each of these little discrete points in space. And so I'll go ahead and put each one of those little discrete points of space in there. And I can think about, again, how would I represent that um, uh, algorithmically? This diffusion operator is really just an average. And so if you think about, for example, the temperature at T sub i, it's really just the average of the two temperatures around it on either side, you know, scaled with the grid spacing h. And so that's represented with this equation here where if you just go ahead and you know, move T sub i over here, you can see that it's an average scaled by h. And then you have these boundary conditions at T sub 0 and, and T sub n, which is our furthest point in the system. So this is now a finite difference uh, discretization of that mathematical model that I just showed you. All right, and you say, well, this is great, but what do I do with this? Well, what you do with this is you put it into a big linear system. And so you can take each one of those T sub i's, and that's really what you're interested in knowing. You know T sub 0 and you know T sub n. Those are your boundary conditions. So you can put those over on the right-hand side. You know what those are already. But what you don't know is T1 through Tn minus 1. But you do know what the coefficients are. You know that it's an average. And so you can see that you've got these, the, the 2 and the, and the 1s as coefficients for the T sub i's. And so you see that, again, here in our matrix. So you just basically have the 2 minus 1 matrix. So this is a standard trilinear system. And now you can go, go ahead and solve this linear system. You may not want to do it by hand, particularly if there are more than, say, five unknowns. But you can do it. And then once you're done with that, you can visualize and analyze the results. So that is what we're going to talk about today in its most simplistic form. But of course, things get much, much more complicated, obviously. We want to model the, the real world. We want to model different physics. And as the problems get more complex, so do the solution strategies that we want to employ for the discretization or for the solution of the linear, nonlinear systems. So for example, there are different discretization strategies that exist for different kinds of needs. You can think about block structured grids. Uh, that are very uh, efficient. They're Cartesian grid representations. You can just refer to them using what's called IJK notation, and it's very, very efficient to store them and to access them. They're very fast. Uh, if you have very complex geometries, you might need more flexibility in how you're representing that geometry. And so you may want to move to something called an unstructured grid, where you can represent the domain in a, in a more general way, but it's more complicated because you have to keep track of where all those grid points are and how they're all connected to each other. Most problems, of course, are time dependent and they're nonlinear, which significantly complicates the, the solve beyond just the linear system solution. So you'll need nonlinear solvers. You'll need interesting time discretization techniques that can handle stiff problems or multi-rate problems. Uh, combining multiple physical processes together, as we talked about, requires very careful handling to get that coupling correct. And then if you have a goal, if you have a design goal in mind or you want to really understand the error, optimization, uncertainty, quantification, et cetera. So I'm just going to take a few minutes and talk a little bit about some of the research that we're doing in some of these areas. So if you think about structured grid technologies, which we're not going to focus on much today, so I'll say a few words about it here. This is something that's been around since the 1980s. Uh, very, very general techniques that uh, do a, have done a lot of work on adaptive mesh refinement to focus grid resolution where you need it to in increase the generality of these approaches. They've moved toward map multi-block, where you can follow domains around. They're still Cartesian in how you reference them, but the, the curves are now, or the shapes are now curves or embedded boundary techniques where you maybe just cut a cell. So you've got basically a structured grid everywhere, except maybe right on the boundaries, where you might have little triangles or, or things that have been cut off. And these, of course, complicate uh, the method in general. So when you think about a structured grid, you've got a coarse grid right next to a fine grid. Well, how do you deal with that interface between the coarse and the fine grid? And how do you do that and maintain the order of accuracy that you're interested in in the discretization technique? 
uh, with map multi-block grids? How do you create high order representations, again, on those block boundaries and for those curved domains? Embedded boundary methods, a lot of times convergence rates or time scale method, time uh, discretization steps are dependent on the size of the grid cell. So if all of a sudden you've got cells that are you know, some normal average size and next to it a tiny, tiny little cut cell, that can mess with your time stepping. And so how do you deal with those kinds of algorithmic complexity? And of course, embedding particles in this. And then how do you deal with the interface between the particles and the mesh and the physics that are happening on the particles with the physics that are happening on the meshes? So widely used in a variety of different applications in the Department of Energy and, and beyond. We will today focus a little bit more on unstructured grids. Uh, Mark Shepard and Sonia Kolev will be talking about this. And again, this is uh, very, very useful where you have very complex domains. You want general representations of those domains, including perhaps curved elements for high order representations. And there's a lot of work that goes into just creating parallel mesh infrastructures. Again, there's a lot more information that needs to be stored with these unstructured grids because you don't know a priori how all those points are connected together or where they are in the domain. And so you need to explicitly store that and access it. And you want to do it in the most efficient way possible. Again, when you're doing mesh adaptivity and quality control, particularly for high order techniques, that's going to require interesting parallel algorithms, perhaps using a dynamic load balancing so that as you're increasing the resolution of the grid in one area, you don't want to run out of memory on that processor. And so you need to move bits of that mesh around. And perhaps you should do that in a predictive way so that you move the mesh before you refine it so you don't run out of memory as you're refining the grid, right? Those kinds of issues come up when you're thinking about these sorts of simulations. So architecture where parallel performance. Again, widely used on a, on a number of different application domains, some of which we'll hear about today. When we're looking at time discretization, we didn't talk about this with our 1D heat equation in a bath, but time discretization is, is just as interesting as spatial discretization, where you've got, for example, complexity in the equations where you need stiff ODE, so, uh, or different time scales coupled together, where some of them are very fast time scales, some of them are slower time scales. How do you do that in an efficient way uh, using multi-rate methods or implicit explicit methods combined together. Uh, there are new techniques where we have recognized that for some problems, you can only break up the problem spatially so far before you run into, say, time step limitations. So if you have more and more processors on these computers, which we do, how can you get more concurrency? Well, by parallelizing in time. And so you think to yourself, well, how do you parallelize in time? Time is sequential. Well. You can think about time actually as a big linear system. And if you start thinking about time discretizations as a linear system, you can start to think about using the same techniques that you solve linear systems in parallel with. You can solve time domains in parallel with, time discretization domains in parallel with. So very interesting uh, techniques that are being developed for, for parallel in time. So, so as the problems go, grow, so do the corresponding linear systems or nonlinear systems that I mentioned earlier. You know, we're targeting problems now with billions and more unknowns uh, on the machines that we have available today. Most of these linear systems or many of these linear systems are very large and very sparse. And so there are specialized techniques that you can use for dealing with very large sparse systems. You don't certainly want to store a lot of zeros. That's not very helpful to you. And it's often the most expensive part of solving uh, the problem. There are many, many profiles that show that doing the linear system solution can take 80, 90 percent of the total solution time. So there's many different techniques that can be used for solving linear systems, ranging from direct methods, so Gaussian elimination, for example, but on a grand scale, or iterative methods, so conjugate gradient, GM res, the various Krylov techniques. Preconditioning typically is very critical. Uh, understanding the architectures and how to implement these effectively on the architectures of today and, the, and tomorrow is absolutely critical. And there are a lot of software tools that exist that deliver this kind of functionality for different sorts of problems. And we'll talk about some of that today. Some of the research that we're looking, on, looking at now in linear system solution ranges. So for example, for linear systems using direct and iterative solvers, one of the things we're very focused on is reducing, for example, synchronization points or data movement 
or communication, because all of that is very expensive on the architectures of today. So when you think about, for example, algebraic multigrid and looking at a Galerkin coarse grid operator for that, that's a product of three matrices. So when you multiply three sparse matrices together, you typically get a lot more zeros in the final matrix product than you had originally. When you have a lot more uh, non-zeros in that final system, you have a lot more communication to do. So that's something you want to avoid. So there's a group at Livermore that's been looking at this and trying to, well, probably many groups that are looking at this, but the group at Livermore I'm most familiar with uh, looked at different strategies. You can just explicitly eliminate some of the non-zeros and see how that impacts your convergence rate. You can look at different kinds of approaches where you do redundant computation. So for that coarse grid solve, instead of doing it uh, communicating information, you just do it on each processor or some subset of processors. And that showed a speed up of three times. Or you can look at uh, different techniques that instead of multiplying those operators together, those matrices together, you can add them together. That's not quite as good from a convergence perspective, but it results in a lot fewer non-zeros in the final matrix, and so you get much faster uh, communication times. And overall, there was a speed up of two, when even though the convergence was slower, because you communicated less, it sped up. So those are the kinds of research uh, techniques that are being incorporated algorithmically into the libraries of today. Uh, Nonlinear systems using various different kinds of acceleration techniques, homotopy techniques, eigensolvers, uh, looking at scaling up for quantum chemistry or uh, other sorts of problems, uh, nuclear mechanics problems, uh, creating parallel eigensolvers that can extract tens of thousands of eigenvalues from a system with millions and doing that effectively in parallels, allowing new kinds of problems to be solved that couldn't be solved before. This is a nice graphic that Bronis D. Sapinski at Livermore developed probably 2000 and order four, five, six-ish. And, and it basically showed what, what the challenges were that, that he saw coming or that we saw coming back in that time frame. And so we're now at the point where we're at vector uh, units and accelerators and being very, very aware of power. So what was predicted several years ago, a decade ago, is now come to fruition and we're up here in this part of the, of the stack worrying about the, these issues when we're implementing algorithms uh, for our high performance computing system. It, we're still very worried about you know, deep uh, non-uniform memory access within the processor, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, data movement constraints, heterogeneous and accelerated architectures. Uh, the one thing that hasn't become as much of a problem as I think we all predicted it would a decade ago is fault tolerance. It's, it's the sort of perennial problem that never quite seems to <laughs> show its ugly head. So, so research for high performance computing uh, is really focused on these two issues, generally speaking. So looking at massive concurrency, and we've already talked about some of the issues there where you need to reduce communication, increase concurrency through, for example, parallel and time type algorithms, reducing synchronization points, David mentioned that in his talk, uh, addressing the memory footprint, and then increasingly looking at these non-uniform memory access, these NUMA architectures. And so the hybrid programming models that you need to incorporate into libraries, and then how do you do that for libraries that need to interact with each other? How do you communicate that information, for example, from the mesh library that this is how my data is partitioned on this very interesting architecture, and how do you communicate that to the linear solver, for example? What are the right steps to do that? What are the abstractions that you need to do that? So some, again, a lot of ongoing research to address these kinds of challenges. So reducing communication, I talked about that a little bit. Uh, hierarchical partitioning and task-based partitioning. So it turns out that if, if you have a parallel computer and you've got a whole bunch of processes that you, or processes that you need to assign to processors on your computer, the way that in which you do that, and if you do that in a smart way, can significantly speed up the application. So there's an example in the climate community where we looked at task placement for atmospheric dynamics where you know, each column of the atmosphere went onto a processor. And as that scaled down and you had just one column per processor, 
uh, the communications were dominating using the native technique in the application. So the Zoltan team at Sandia started looking at that and through very careful task placement and understanding where to put those tasks, they saved the application about 30% in its runtime, which is huge. Just thinking about it didn't really change anything fundamental about the algorithm that just changed where those tasks were going to go and understanding the architecture and the application allowed them to do that. So increasing concurrency, we've talked about parallel in time as one example of increasing concurrency. There's new eigensolver techniques that are doing that, looking at extreme scaling of unstructured grids on millions and millions of processors, reducing synchronization points. So pipeline versions of Krylov solvers, conjugate gradient and GM res, we found that we can reduce the overheads associated with those synchronization points by just deferring them. So for a pipeline of two, defer it for a pipeline of two, and you can save yourself you know, 20% 20, 20 of your runtime just by doing that. You know, addressing the memory footprint issues, I already mentioned predictive load balancing, for example, and then increasing the communication and, and computation overlap. So, so software libraries are what we're going to focus on today. And so I'll just conclude my part of the talk with talking a little bit about software libraries and the progress that we've made in developing them to facilitate computational science and engineering in the DOE community and beyond. So if you look at Wikipedia uh, and you say, what is a software library? The definition is a high quality encapsulated, documented, tested, and multi-use software collection that provides functionality commonly, commonly need by application developers. So that's formal definition of a software library. And it's really organized for the purpose of being used and reused in a lots of different application settings. So it encapsulates all of that complexity that I just talked about so that the applications only need to understand uh, what are the uh, appropriate interfaces for interacting with that library. What's the API? What's the right types of ways in which to use the um, library, et cetera. There are a number of libraries that, that we'll talk about today, uh, or mention at least, so those with the gold stars uh, will be mentioned in, in a great detail in some of our lectures today or in our highlight slides uh, coming up. So you can see it's just a wide range of, of libraries that are available from the DOE and many more. So when we started looking at exascale computing, and what the applications need. There was a survey that was performed and they looked at a number of different application teams or talked to a number of different application teams and asked them, what do you really need? And what came up over and over and over again is that they were using four or five different numerical libraries together and they wanted them to work well together, to interoperate well, to be able to compile well. Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of stories that we hear about how long it took to compile an application. I mean, Mark has lived this. <laughs> you know, even within the fast math team, when we were first starting our quest toward interoperability, it took us ages to get it to compile, right? And what were the problems that we encountered? Well, namespace collisions, how we were using MPI in different ways. It's all these different, um, you know, versions of the compiler not being compatible. Just, it's a lot of stuff that you've got to think about. And when somebody is trying to take advantage of a library that's already built on a machine, they need to know that it's compatible with other things they're doing. I mean, it's just, it's crufty. And so, well, that's basically what I just said. It's crufty. So, <laughs> so we want to enhance programmer productivity, not slow them down by providing libraries. So. So that's really what the XSDK uh, effort, which is part of the Ideas Project and now part of uh, ECP, the Exascale Computing Project, is providing that foundation to do. So they really want to create highly effective software ecosystems, not just single libraries, but whole ecosystems of those libraries that work well together. And so they've been doing that through a, through a number of different mechanisms, including uh, working with library teams, creating community standards, creating best practices that they ask folks to comply with. And so as of December 2017, this is what the ecosystem looked like. So the libraries in green were all part of the XSDK and all complied to a certain set of uh, community standards that were developed by the team 
and implemented by these software developers so that they could build well together. Uh, there are more domain components coming and more libraries planned to be included as we go forward into this year and the next year. So there's a lot of work that's being put into this to make sure that the ecosystem is sound. And that's for our discretization techniques, our linear solvers, our nonlinear solvers, and, and so, so on and so forth. So, so here are some of the policies that I just mentioned as being a challenge for software developers. So for example, they wanted the folks in the SXDK, SS, XSDK to support either autoconf or CMake options. So they didn't have to use autoconf for CMake, but they had to use the same interfaces so that there was a very consistent look and feel for how you built a piece of software that was part of this package. You know, being able to, to use an MP, a user-provided MPI communicator, i.e., you don't own MPI Comworld as a library. You, you get a communicator from, from the user. Uh, respecting resources, using an open source license, uh, linking against outside copies of external software. All of these 16 policies were created with the idea in mind that you could create a robust infrastructure. And then recommended policies, like having a public repository, being able to use Valgrind to address memory issues. Those sorts of things became important in this. It's a primary delivery vehicle for the Exascale Computing Project math libraries, uh, which we just talked about. And so the gallery of highlights, I'm not gonna go through these in detail, they're here for your information. They're part of your slide deck so that you have some information about where to go for some of the libraries that we'll be talking about today. Uh, they're organized and listed first by the packages that we'll be featuring in today's lectures. And then there are several other libraries that are available as well. It's not a comprehensive list by any means, but it's a, it's a starting point. And so just to give you a sense of what's on each slide, it's the library name and where it's from basically what it is, a very high level description of what it is and what it's for, what the interfaces are, uh, various types of capabilities, where you can uh, have access to it. And so again, here's MFEM, which we'll be talking about later today. Similar title, what it is at a very high level, some of the capabilities, the open source software, where you can get more information. So that's the general structure for these slides. I encourage you to take a look at some of these software packages as you're learning more about them today or if we don't hit on some of the things you're interested in, uh, you can you know, take a look at these and see if there's something represented here that meets your needs. And then the hands-on lessons, uh, again, these will be scattered throughout the day. Mark will be leading us through, through many of them and has been <laughs> done yeoman's work in putting them together. And so there's going, he's gonna to start today, and we're gonna start actually right now with a simple hand-coded heat equation intro. So our 1D rod in a bath, you'll actually get to do something with that. Uh, and then these are the different sorts of uh, hands-on applications that you'll have access to today. The GitHub pages site, it's right here so that you can have access to it. It should be bookmarked or you should bookmark it so that you have easy access to it. Mm -hmm.